natural frequency, forced vibrations, and resonance. We're going to talk about the definitions of each of those, what affects each of those, and what's the relationship between each of those. So natural frequency, the frequency at which an object will vibrate or oscillate when hit or struck. So, you know, we're not hitting the kid here. We're just giving him a little bit of a push. But if you just give them a little bit of a push, step back and just watch what happens. They're going to oscillate back and forth at some frequency. The frequency that they just do naturally is, the, is what is called the natural frequency. And we sometimes see that term elsewhere. Uh, this is something called IRENU. It's a band that uses natural frequencies to promote strength. Well, they are not using that term in the way physics uses that term, unless they're talking about if you like strike it with a little something, your finger, and it makes a little dink. That little sound would be the frequency that naturally vibrates back and forth at. But I think they're trying to use this in terms of um, a way that would fool you into thinking this actually does something, that it possesses natural frequencies that are good for you. And I, I'll just say it's my opinion, but I think it's completely wrong. All right, a tuning fork. If you strike a tuning fork and you deform it past its equilibrium position, it's going to spring back and overshoot that equilibrium position, but then it'll just oscillate back and forth between those two points at some frequency. This tuning fork would be 512 hertz, which is C. And so let's see what variables might affect the frequency that it oscillates back and forth. So I was our abbreviation for rotational inertia. M is mass. L is the length of this thing. This is a rod that's pivoting at one end, and the rotational inertia is one third mass times length squared. So the more mat, the, sorry, the more inertia this thing has, the more it's going to resist going back and forth. The slower it's going to do that, or the lower frequency. So if that thing had more mass, it would have a lower natural frequency. If the rod were shorter in length, well, that would be less inertia. It'd be easier to go back and forth, and it would have a higher natural frequency. If it was made out of something other than aluminum, if it wasn't quite as springy or elastic, it might not snap back as quickly and have a lower natural frequency. And so the velocity that those waves pass back and forth on this thing, uh, a lower velocity with the same wavelength would be a lower frequency. And I do want to connect standing waves to natural frequency. So the frequencies that this naturally will go back and forth are the frequencies that produce standing waves on that medium. And knowing the properties of this materials, uh, these materials, you can engineer things to oscillate back and forth at particular frequencies. So these little um, fingers here will, when they're plucked, oscillate back and forth, but you can engineer and make that happen. Guitar strings, you pluck it, you pull it away from its equilibrium position, it will, when you let go, it will overshoot equilibrium and then oscillate between those positions. And what variables affect that? Well, the wavelength of this thing is fixed between here and here. And if the waves traveled faster on that medium, a higher velocity with a fixed wavelength would produce higher frequencies. So some of the things that affect the velocity would be the tension in that string. Uh, that's the variable force. So if you had a higher tension you tighten these strings, the waves are going to go back and forth faster, but higher velocity would be a higher frequency because the wavelength is fixed between both those ends. This variable is mu. It's not the coefficient of friction. It's the linear density of that string, how much mass there is per unit length. So thicker strings would have more mass in a given length, and so that's in the denominator down here. So thicker strings in the denominator, um, bigger linear density would be a smaller velocity. Smaller velocity, a smaller frequency.
get the same wavelength. And do remember again that the frequencies that this can go back and forth are the same frequencies that produce standing waves, the fundamental frequency, the first overtone, second overtone, and so on. And it doesn't have to be a musical instrument. It could be anything. You just give the thing a little thump and it's going to deform and then it's going to oscillate between those two positions. And so if you thump the table, it will make a tone, the frequency that oscillates naturally back and forth at. And then um, the leg would, you hit it, it's going to make a little bit different sound. Drums, you give it a thump, they vibrate at some frequency. This was a little toy I made for my kids. It was about three feet tall, and these were little um, leaves that were made out of wood, all of them different sizes, and you would roll marbles down there, and when they hit those little leaves, they would make a little tone. The smaller ones would make a higher tone. The lower ones would make a lower tone, and it was a lot of fun. And then in this example here, um, natural frequency is used in um, the medical field. It's called... Um, medical percussion where you can like tap on someone's back here um, they either use this not not for testing reflexes but um, they could either use that or often they just tap with their fingers up and down your back and listen to the tones that they're hearing if they hear unequal from left to right it might mean you have a pleural effusion which is means you have uh, water on your lungs but tapping under this area here, which is water, is going to sound different than that same spot over there. And that would be, you know, just a simple way of testing without doing an x-ray. All right, now that we've done natural frequency, let's do forced vibrations. And that's just that you can force something to move back and forth at any rate you want. You just have to physically move it. Or in this case, you use a magnet and a coil that uses um, voltage at different frequencies to make the cone of the speaker move back and forth. So the magnetic fields down here is forcing that cone to vibrate. And you could send in uh, a different frequency signal and have it oscillate at a higher frequency. That's just forced vibrations. Coming back to my example uh, with pushing a kid on a swing, you could physically shake them back and forth and force them to vibrate at any frequency you choose. And then some of the neat things about forced vibrations is this little music box movement. If you just turn that little dial, it's going to make the faintest little sound. You may hardly be able to hear it. But when that is resting on the wood here, the little vibration of those fingers forces the whole wooden box to vibrate, and it sounds like this. So when the whole box was vibrating, it created a much louder, richer sound because much more air was vibrating. And that's the same thing here, like with a piano, just the strings vibrating aren't going to make a lot of loud, rich sounds. But there's this board under the strings that the strings force that board to vibrate, and then it makes the loud, rich sound, and that's called the sounding board. Uh, similarly, the string vibrates, making the whole guitar vibrate, and that's why it makes such nice, loud, rich sounds. All right, resonance. Let's see if we can define resonance, but do it in terms of natural frequency and forced vibrations. Well, resonance occurs when you force an object to vibrate at its natural frequency. When you shake something back and forth at the same frequency, it naturally wants to move back and forth. So if I were to just thump that and let it oscillate back and forth, that would be its natural frequency. But if I use this speaker to force that to vibrate at the same frequency it naturally wants to vibrate, then it will really begin to vibrate. It's just like with the swing here. Um, give it a little shove and step back, that's natural frequency. Shake it back and forth at any frequency you want, that's resonance. 
but if you give the little shoves at just the right moments, at the same frequency it naturally wants to go back and forth, then you can really get swinging back and forth, and that's called resonance. So again, we can look at what variables affect the natural frequency of a swing. It's kind of like just a simple pendulum. And the period of the pendulum, 2 pi square root of L over G, where L is the length and G is the acceleration of gravity. So however long that thing is, the longer the pendulum, the longer the time it's going to take to make a complete oscillation. And period and frequency are reciprocals. Uh, this swing would have a lower natural frequency than this one. But if you just sit on that swing and move your legs back and forth at any old frequency, you're really not going to go anywhere. You have to move your legs back and forth and your whole body at the same frequency it naturally wants to move at. So these are two tuning forks, and this one has little weights on there where I can adjust the frequency that it oscillates at. You can see nothing really happened to that one. When I, when I put my hand there, it stopped all the sound. Now I'm going to move those weights up just a little bit. Putting them further from the pivot is going to give it more rotational inertia. And these, this tuning fork is going to go back and forth slower than it did just a moment ago. But now the frequency that this is vibrating at is going to match the natural frequency of this one and see what happens. <laughs> See, that one started to go too. And it's just the oscillations of this one, the vibrations of that make pulses of air that go across and hit this thing. And as long as they're hitting at the same frequency as its natural frequency, it will resonate. We can do that with springs as well. So this is a little mechanical oscillator and the period of a spring is two pi square root of M over K where M is the mass that's on there, K is the spring constant, how stiff it is, but those two variables affect the period of the spring. And then knowing the period, we could find the frequency because they're reciprocals of each other. Let me first move this back and forth at just one hertz. And now it's going back and forth at two hertz, but notice right here, it slowed way down and then it started going again. But now I'm gonna change this to 1.8 and then it's gonna really begin to go. Two hertz down here wasn't quite the same frequency that it naturally wanted to go. Sometimes it was pulling in the right direction, but sometimes it was opposing it. When I dropped that down to 1.8 hertz, it was perfectly in step with the frequency it naturally wanted to go at. And we can do that with these little fingers here as well. Each one of those, because one, some are long, some are short, everything in the middle, they're gonna naturally move at different frequencies. This is forcing them all to vibrate, but if I can force it to vibrate at the frequency it naturally wants to go, watch this one here, then it will really begin to go. And about 23 hertz is where it really starts to go. If I dial it up higher and higher and higher frequencies, then these shorter ones would also start to really go. Well, that's kind of the same thing that what happens when there's an earthquake. All of these buildings here are little fingers sticking up in the air. Some are long, some are short. Some would sway back and forth with a very short period or a high frequency, and some would take a lot longer. But if there's an earthquake and it shakes everything, there's different ways the earth could shake. It could shake very fast like this, or it could shake very slow. But if the frequency that those are being forced to vibrate matches the frequency they naturally vibrate at, then they will really begin to vibrate. I think I've said that a few times now. This is a fun example that I've come across. There's a, a climbing area uh, in Golden, and I have to hike across this bridge to get to the climbing area, and I'm carrying a pack. And if I walk with my friends and we're in step, I notice that a spot around one-fourth the way from this end and one-fourth the way from that end, this bridge will really begin to move, and it's a little eerie because it's bouncing up and down. So let's see if we can understand that. As you walk, you're pushing the ground down with every step you take. And if 
every time you step down, the bridge moves down a little bit, but if you're stepping at the same frequency the bridge naturally will go back and forth at, every step is going to amplify that wave and it can really begin to go. So um, you recognize this is a standing wave with a node right here in the center, anti-node here, and an anti-node here. This is one quarter the way down the bridge. If I were to look at other standing waves that occur could occur there. Now this one is this red wave that I have. If another way that bridge could oscillate would be this blue wave bouncing up and down like that. But the blue wave has twice the wavelength so it has half the frequency. Those two are inversely proportional because all waves on that bridge travel at the same velocity. So it's not going to oscillate here. When I get to the middle of that bridge, if I keep the same pace, the bridge doesn't really vibrate because right there I'm stepping down, but I'm also stepping down when the bridge is trying to come up. And it's going to stop it from, from vibrating. You aren't going to get that overall increase in amplitude because you're just adding a little bit of energy at the right place. Here, sometimes it was right, but when you got down here, your foot was stepping down at the wrong time stepping down when it was trying to come up. We could look at standing waves and resonance on a loop of wire like this. Lots of different ways that loop of wire could um, make standing waves. Okay, And as I go higher and higher frequencies, it doesn't look like much is happening. But watch what happens when I get just the right frequency. There it goes right there. It really begins to go. It's resonating. And an interesting example of that is with haunted bars or restaurants or taverns or hotels. Um, there's been a few case studies on this and places that are claimed to be haunted, meaning people um, ex claim they see ghostly aberrations kind of out of the corner of their, their eye. And lots of people um, claim that because they see things and they can't explain it. Well, if you approach that from a scientific um, I, you will, might realize that there was a, all of those places had fans in the ceiling. And as that fan goes round and round very, very fast, it can make your eyeball resonate because it's not just sending down a steady stream of air, it's sending little pulses of air every time a blade passes overhead. And if those pulses at the same frequency as your eyeball naturally will wiggle back and forth that will like freak out and make shadows in your inside of your eye and that's what seems to cause these ghostly aberrations now a glass like this is like a ring or some a sphere as well but if this is the rim of the cup there's lots of different frequencies that would produce standing waves the fundamental the first overtone second overtone and you can shatter that glass by playing the same note as the glass naturally would move at. Now, it's not that you have to sing a super high note, super loud, to make glass shatter. You just have to sing the right note. You have to sing the same note as that glass would sing back to you if you just dink it with your finger. You dink it with your finger, you find its natural frequency, then you just sing back that same tone and it can get oscillating so much and the bends uh, so much that it fractures and breaks. And this is one I did in my class here, but uh, class here, it starts to oscillate and I hold it in place, it shatters. So that's a little bit about natural frequency, force vibrations, and um, resonance. Hope you enjoyed.